So what made these, these two one entity, what made it a confederal system, is that there was another executive at the level of the empire as a whole, of the two of them together, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so not separately here and separately here. Understand that these, these governments here ran the life of these inhabitants, this government here ran the life of these inhabitants, but there was a common level of government which had basically three ministers. One of foreign affairs, of the army, so defense, military, and there was a finance minister. And there was the, the, the emperor who also was active in policy making, which makes him makes less of a constitutional monarchy, uh, of a parliamentary system, because he is an active policy maker. But only in these areas did they have a common executive. Uh, and there was also there was also a common parliament. But this parliament didn't always meet. It was basically representatives of these parliaments who uh, met once a year, and an equal number from, from both, I think it was 60-60. So they were representatives of the individual parliaments here. Again, similar to the American U.S. confederations, uh, the first model, right? Where the, where the Congress was actually representatives of the states, not of the people, right? The, the, the percentage. So you have a common, uh, and that's called the Reichsrat. And that is, means the in, Imperial Council. So this is why the whole thing was called the lands and kingdoms represented in the Reichsrat. The lands and kingdoms represented in the Reichsrat. Right? That's what makes it confederate. Right? But again, the Reichsrat was more consultative than anything else, right? And it mostly decided on the money that was given to for foreign affairs, military, and finance. Okay? So, that, so you have a sort of an imperial legislature which is actually delegates from these two entities. So this is why it's a dual monarchy, because it has two different states. This is why it's a revolutionary thing, in a way, right? Because you have one state, the other state, each of them with their own government, but then commonly in Vienna they share certain responsibilities, certain ministries, and delegates of their own, the two parliaments meet there to take decisions about only about those ministries. Okay? And the emperor is separately emperor of this and king of this. Okay? And you're going to say, well, this has become clear. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, this is simple. But of course, it's not. Because remember the name, the lands and kingdoms represented in the Reichsrat. Later Austrian, uh, Austrian uh, uh, historians will, will call it Donau Monarchy. So the, um, the empire of the Danube. Remember that I posted that, that, that map of the Danube and told you that um, Central Eastern Europe in many ways is this space defined by the Danube. Well, they called the very, uh, you know, the very entity of the Austrian Empire, the Donau Monarchy, because it's, it's basically, this is the uniting, kind of a coherent uh, linchpin, and so on, and, and, and what else to call it, right? It wasn't the Empire of Austria, because it wasn't. Right? It was the Empire of many lands, many different lands, basically put into two lands. And here I get to the second part, that it wasn't as simple as, as such. That's, you know, I would just call it Austrian part, but uh, it's Sicily time is more accurate. Because the Austrian part and the Hungarian part, the two entities actually had sub-entities. Because the Austrian part was constituted of Austria proper, of Bohemia, right? Of Galicia, right? So of different other lands, of uh, Carniola, of Dalmatia, or whatever. So you have... Uh, uh, the Austrian part itself is a multi, sort of a multi-land entity. The Cisleitania itself is constituted of different other local entities. Each of them had a, a, a sort of level of self-government, but you know, not comparable with the government in Budapest and the government here uh, in Vienna that governed the two different entities. Those were the major holders of power. But subcomponents had some self-government as well. And remember, Austria, the little Austria here, Bohemia, which is, we've learned of Bohemia, was 
And remember, throughout history, it had had its own diet, but that diet was kept, right? Galicia, which was the part taken from Poland, when the Poland was partitioned, right, had its own little diet. Bukovina, which was part of, well, today's Ukraine and, and slash Romania, um, so uh, Bukovina here was, had its own uh, little, you know, units and so on, and Dalmatia and so on. And that's in the Austrian part. In the Hungarian part, there was the major part was, you know, Hungary proper. And the second major part was Croatia Slavonia or Croatia. Because remember that traditionally the Croatians have been part of the Hungarian kingdom. This is why the compromise, the Ausgleich, was a huge deal, a huge coup for the Hungarians. First of all, because through the Ausgleich of 1867, they have obtained most of what they have been asking in 1848, at the time of the revolution. Uh, you know, a revolution that was crushed, remember, by the Austrians, uh, which helps on the Russians and so on. So, uh, the, the, it was a big deal because they recovered their historical statehood, which the Poles didn't have anymore, which the Czechs didn't have anymore, which none of these peoples had anymore. The, their statehood that they had since the Middle Ages, and even stronger than then in many ways. Right? And that was a, that's why it was a big deal. But the Croatians always had this, uh, you know, they had their own sabor, right? Well, they kept their own sabor, but it was now in relation to the Hungarian uh, uh, center, to the Hungarian crown, right? Because again, understand that the compromise created a dual monarchy, created two different entities. But within these entities, there were some entities <laughs> which responded and, and uh, you know, had to respond to the authority of the center of each of these entities. And hence many problems. Hence many problems, right? First of all, this Hungary here, right, the Hungarian kingdom, then will be made of Hungary proper and Croatia Slavonia. Croatia Slavonia will have its own diet and suburb, right? But it will have a central government. It's, it's like levels of federalism. Remember that these two also have a common government here. So this is how it works. Common government in these entities, smaller Austria, uh, uh, Bohemia, Galicia, Bukovina, and other lands are all represented in the Austrian parliament. Uh, Hungary, uh, Hungary proper, Croatia, whatever other lands had some level of self-presentation are represented in the parliament in Budapest, in Hungary. And then these two are, have a common parliament at the level of the entire monarchy. These are like levels of federalism. Well, if it sounds complicated, it is because, <coughs> because it was so respectful, as you can notice, of the historical reality of different nationalities and of different historical nations, so to speak. Remember the historical nation, right? The fact that there has always been a nation of Poland in the sense of a nation of nobles, of having a political reality. And Croatia, right? A nation of nobles, right? Has had a political reality. Um, Bohemia has had a political reality. It has had its own diet throughout history. This is why we studied it. Right? And it was so respectful of these and even gave, you know, different um, recognition to groups that never really had their own, uh, you know, statehood, right? So this, this system of multi-level confederal system, in which there are two major entities, Austrian and Hungarian, with sub-entities in different relationships, and then a common, you know, foreign affairs and military uh, led by the emperor, that's basically the, the, the Austro-Hungarian empire. You see how, how complex it is. This creates certain issues, not because it was complex, because this complexity serves the reality on the ground. Listen, you know, theoretically, it could have taken the Russian Tsar's method and simply say, you know what, forget about this. All of it is my empire. That's it, it's mine. I'm going to rule it the way I want it. You know, I get the support from whatever. That's what recognition of different you know, lands and so on. You see, there's a way to do that as well. But that wasn't the way. 
that wasn't the way. Um, okay. So, however, one of the problems was not that it was it had this complexity necessarily. The problem was that certain elements, like Bohemia, as I mentioned, right, wanted to didn't want to be part of like a second level, second degree, like as I mentioned, second rate partner in the whole thing. Because now they're first level partners, Austria or Cisleitania and Hungary, right? These are the two major elites. And Bohemia is just included in the Cisleitania part. With its, you know, with some significant level of, of self-government, but not like this. So they wanted to be a third partner. Or there was the other project of uniting all the Slavs in the empire and making that a third party, or maybe even a second party to the empire. So making the empire into a sort of a confederation of three units. The Slavs, the Hungarians, and the, well, Austrians, whatever that is. Right. Uh, so, but it didn't work, uh, for, for various reasons which your book uh, talks about, so I'm not going to go into, into the detail. Another problem here that emerged from this is the fact that each of these units, notice that they're, they are drawn based on historical, uh, the historical existence of, of these political entities. Meaning there, there was in history of Bohemia always had its own you know, representation, I mean nobles, their own diet, Moravia, uh, Silesia, Galicia, uh, Bukovina, uh, Croatia, Slavonia, which was you know, Croatia with uh, Slavonia, uh, and, 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 right? Dalmatia and so on. So you have all these lands, and all of these are historical lands. Lands that have always had an, an, a certain historical identity. Right? Uh, but, they do not correspond with the distribution of ethnic groups, of ethnocultural groups. And you got, you're going to ask, well, why should they? Well, what are we, when, when is this going on? What are we talking about? We are talking about the middle of the uh, 19th century. The heart of the 19th century, the age of nationalism. This is the age when, when the national idea becomes the running idea. That people who are part of the same nation should govern their own selves and be responsible for their own fate and should have their own state. Now, of course, the problem is that who is that people who should govern themselves? Right? How do you define them? Because just because someone speaks uh, the same language or dialect as we have discovered in the southern part here, doesn't make them the same entity. Because they speak the same dialect, but these are Croats, these are Bosnians, these are Serbs, and so on. So who's, you know, uh, de defining this common identity along the language, and that's just a rule. Why? What does it mean that you speak the, the same language? Does it mean that you're part of the same nation? Well, you know that US, Canadian, uh, uh, you know, English, New Zealand, Australian, they all speak English. Are they part of the same nation? So what is, you know, what is going to be the criteria, right? So that's a, that's a problem, but, so the whole idea that uh, each nation is to have a state and that who is a nation or whatever, defined along ethno-cultural lines, which means language, religion, tradition, history, whatever, culture, uh, creates huge problems. Because no, n never in history were states, never in history were states or rarely in history were states designed, meaning states by states, I mean these uh, spheres of political authority designed along such ethnic lines. Maybe in the time of the Greek city-states, which were the size of Ellensburg. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it was people who were related. Uh, so that is, that is the biggest of, of a huge problem. Because there is no way to draw in a region that is extremely, you know, it has all these ethnic groups and whatever, how do you draw a line that includes only the people that you associate with, with I don't know, Serbs? Because you have Serbs here, you have Serbs also in what is the land of Croatia and whatever, so how do you do this? Except war. To carve out territory. Okay? And, and that, is, that is the conundrum, right? That is the conundrum. That all of this is trying to, is trying to be predicated this is the big challenge that, you know, the heart of this project, the heart of the, of the, this, the failure of the project, is the fact that this sort of a federal, confederal, 
you know, there were projects of federalizing this, this, this thing, creating it into completely federal. Each land will have their own, uh, you know, governor and then a common government. You know, you know the federal system. Right? It, it, towards the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there were several such attempts, in the sense of, you know, writing projects. And many argue that if that would have been the case, if that would have worked, then perhaps World War II, or at least uh, uh, World War II, and you know, communism, the spread of communism, they say, would never have happened, because we would have had a strong state in between the huge giants of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. state that could withstand their pressure, and ally itself with others, and blah blah blah, all those things. And instead, what you'll have will be small states, and that's what we're covering in the interwar period uh, you know, section of our course. And they will all fall prey, both to the World War II and to communism. But what if this remains together? What if this remains together as a reformed administratively so that each land gets their own whatever they want, but still constitutes a strong enough power based on a shared culture still, to a good degree. That's the point, that there is a shared culture. But it wasn't to be, because, because one of the reasons was that the power of the, this, this idea of nationalism is, is tremendous. And it is very powerful because it has to do with identity and self-understanding. You know, what are you is the question, and many will answer, I am a. Frenchman, I am a German, I am a Serb, I am a... So it becomes part of your very identity. It's like, it becomes this bond of, of, of not true, but it becomes, it's like a bond of family or, or bond of blood, which is not true. Because remember, the criterion was language. Well, language doesn't mean you're related. Right? But it's a very powerful thing, and you say, we, us, should be together and not ourselves. The problem is that there is no clear you, the way to define, to divide this we us with them us because you live in the same village two doors down. So what do you do? You kill, you take, get rid of the guy and then, uh, you know, because he's a different one, right? Because, and again, this is not very uh, far from how we see each other. Because, you know, if you ask, if someone asks you, well, wait a minute, why shouldn't you be part of Canada? It's going to sound weird. No, no, because this is our country. Well, that's the exact thing. Because we, we define that there is an our, us, who is not them. Why not? Right? And here you, we can't even speak of, 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 uh, of language. Right? And how many common cultural aspects are in there? And so on. So what, what is it that, why not one state? Why not just put everything into Canada? Right? You see how, how identity goes deep into how nationality, the idea of nationhood goes so deep into identity. This is why it's so powerful. And then people die for it and go to war for it. Okay? So that's the problem, that this is all going on in the time of nationalism. At the, at the, at the height of the national idea. And the problem is that, and here's the, the, the conundrum, that the historical nations which was basically, what were these? The historical nations were in fact the lands that previously have had self-government, that have had, not self-government, that have had their own centers of government. Bohemia has had its own diet. Croatia has had its own summer. Hungary has had its own diet of nobles. Transylvania and so on. Right? So the idea was to, that th this is why you still have these lands distinctly recognized. And this is why the empire is called the lands and kingdoms represented in the Reichsrat, in the sort of the confederal, uh, imperial council, the confederal parliament. This is why. Because they're lands. But the problem is that these historical nations, meaning these lands, like Hungary, Croatia, Bohemia, whatever, do not correspond with the other thing, with the ethno- ethno-linguistic groups. And these are those groups that discover ethnic nationality in the 19th century. The Slovaks, the Romanians, 
right? Who define themselves as Rome aliens, right? Uh, and and uh, the Ruthenians or Ukrainians, right? But it was called Ruthenians, right? All these who never had a statehood, right? But claim statehood now. Well, guess where they find themselves within these historical nations. So thus you have the historical nation or slash land of Hungary actually has only 55% of this historical nation or land, right? Actually, the land is ethnic Hungarian. 55% are consider themselves to be part of the ethnocultural group of Hungarians. Because you go to Transylvania and you see that in this part of Transylvania, which now is part of the Kingdom of Hungary, 55% of this part is actually Romanian. And overall, I don't know, 15-20% or whatever it was. So you have Romania, you have Slovaks who have always been part of the Hungarian kingdom but never had the conscious political identity or political role. Uh, uh, you know, they usually were, most of them, uh, these northern Slavs that were part of the Hungarian state have been mostly peasants and so on. So there's this history of sort of differentiation of classes, also overlapping with differentiation of language, but not entirely, but it's there, right? Uh, so, you have within these lands, you have ethnic groups, some of which have a claim to historical statehood, like the Czechs here, like the Poles in Galicia, which always had Poland, remember Galicia is just this part of Poland that is now within the, the empire, other parts are in the Russian empire and in Prussia. And in Gal let's take Galicia, let's not take Hungary, let's take Galicia, which is one of these historical lands, fragment of old Poland, where the Polish nobility here claims the right to be recognized as a historical nation, meaning we always had political statehood. But there is a large proportion of the population here is actually Ruthenian. Or Ukraine, right? And they never had statehood and they're oppressed by these Polish, because they're the, the Polish historical nation does not recognize the ethno-linguistic group of Ruthenians, or if it, it does, it still doesn't grant it the rights that it claims from the emperor. You see how difficult and complicated this is in the sense of, not that we make it, this is the situation on the ground. And this will be the situation also after the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because the, the, the states that were born from them, they were not the pure nation states, as I said, uh, as noted in the notes on the interwar period. None of those no state is purely made of, composed of ethnic this or ethnic that. Because you can't make that. The, the region is just so intertwined. So, you know, uh, uh, you, you can't cut that way. But the attempt to cut it that way will lead to the wars in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Because Bosnia will be traditional, typical, you know already, that sort of an intermingled group of, you know, there, there is no way of separating, or there is no line, because it's the same building, not the same city, not the same village, not the same street, the same building where the different ethnicities live together. How do you separate? Right? If the nation, each nation is to have a state, that's the canon. So you will have in Galicia the Polish nobility, representative of the Polish historical nation, having more rights and kind of oppressing the Ruthenian ethno-linguistic group. In Bohemia you will have two ethnic groups that historically have had power, the Czechs from Bohemia and the Germans from Bohemia, right? Because both of them remember from Hus, Jan Hus and all these have had, uh, 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 you know, political role. So the clash will be here between the Czechs and the Germans. Czechs who most of them spoke German because they studied it in school, obviously Czechs are Slavs, Germans who refuse to speak Czech. Right? Here's a clash of, of two equal groups. Right? Then uh, you go to uh, you, you go to Hungary, right? You have the problem between the Hungarians as a historical nation and the ethno-linguistic group of the Slovaks or the ethno-linguistic group of the Romanians in Transylvania. 
which is complicated by the fact that the state of Romania that forms here around, remember, by the unification of those two provinces, would kind of foster fuel uh, silently, or at least uh, indirectly, or not the state, but the, some associations, would foster the claims and ambitions of the Romanians here. But remember, Transylvania has always been multi-ethnic. Always. Literally always. From the beginning of its existence. Okay? So no matter who, who gets it, someone will be in minority. There is a large Hungarian population, large German population, and other ethnicities. Serbians, and whatever. All, almost all of these are here. So here's a ground. How do you create nation states in a multi-ethnic space? That is at the heart of the problem of Central Eastern Europe. Because, and even today, okay. So, so the 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 a lot of the troubles came uh, from from this uh, complex makeup, from this complex makeup of the empire, and 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 you as you read through the chapters, through the materials, you see. All the, all, the, all, the, all the burden, all the negative luggage, uh, all, all the tensions that emerge from this um, and that lead to its breakup. You know, obviously there were, you know, uh, it's not unidimensional, right? And you have the support of this arrangement from a good part of the Hungarian elite. The Polish nobles all supported the Habsburg, the Habsburg, this Habsburg project, you know, the Habsburg Emperor and its project. The, the, from the Czechs, a good part supported the, the, the project, but then they were disappointed, they, didn't, they weren't put on the same level as the Hungarians. The Croats were ambivalent, especially since the Hungarian part was worse governed than the Austrian part. It was worse governed, not necessarily economically, but in terms of this issue of nationalities. The Hungarians in their, the Hungarian uh, government of this time, in their incredible short-sightedness, pursued the policy of majorization, of, of assimilating a very rich, uh, a very diverse uh, population of land, in which they were only 55% of the population. So, try to assimilate 45% of the population who is of different ethnicity. That's ambitious, isn't it? Right? Back to our discussion of Koshut versus Seichen. Right? Uh, and, and it will be disastrous. And these policies will backfire when the whole empire fa falls apart. And Hungary is one of the losers of the breakup of the empire. It will lose two thirds of its territory. Two thirds, as you will see on the maps of the interwar period. And many of the ethnic Hungarians will now part, be part of a different state, successor state, where they will be at their turn oppressed. Okay, so we talked about the problems, but how about the advantages? Because that's that's the conundrum of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Why all these writers, and I gave you a quote from uh, Stefan Zweig, who was a Jew, Jewish person, uh, 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 it's, in, it's uh, one of the materials, his quote from The World of Yesterday, one of his memoirs, a beautiful book, uh, and quotes uh, in, in another article that I posted, there's a quote from Freud, who was no fan of the uh, whole thing, but regretted its disappearance. So why do people look back with, with nostalgia? Why do people uh, regret this? And, you know, Milan Kundera, when he talks about Central Europe and he mentions all those names, Many of those names are names of authors who were produced here. Because that's the other side of, of this multinational, multicultural empire. Because it was a relaxed environment, it was an environment in which, generally speaking, especially in the Cisleitania, people were not oppressed. The Jewish people, you know, despite some anti-Semitic tendencies within the population, not the emperor, to the contrary, and not the elites, the, the top elites, uh, you know, the Jewish people never had it as, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, comparatively with Russia or, or with Germany. This was one of the places in which they were the most integrated, the most, uh, the possibilities were the greatest. This is why Freud became what he became. He was Jewish. Mahler, and, and on and on the names of writers, Kafka, uh, and so on, writers, composers, painters, well, name it, psychologists, whatever, philosopher, who made it big in Vienna, in the capital of the empire, of both parts in a way, right? Uh, in Vienna, became this hotbed of civilization. Because here's the, the positive side. 
Because here, through this, through the fact that this was all part of one administrative structure, uh, it also benefited from a space of, of natural interaction. So Vienna became uh, uh, the center of culture, one of the greatest centers of culture in, of the last centuries. And certainly of the last century. Because that's where all these people from all these parts, the elites, met. And a, 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 an atmosphere of cultural creation, of effervescence, was created. Not just because they met, but that was an important thing. Because it's this intercultural uh, pollination in which you don't dissolve into a nothingness, but you influence each other. That creates, you know, Kafka. Again, Kafka was a Jewish person in Prague who wrote in German. Jewish from Prague, Bohemia, who wrote in German, who was not his native language. He's one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Okay? And this sort of a multilingual, plurilingual, you know, multicultural dimension, but not melting pot. Once again, not melting pot. Yeah? Nobody melts their identity. It's layers of identity, layers of culture, right? of which, which, in which you all partake. Because you speak German, you speak Hungarian, you speak Romanian, you speak this and that. And you're part and, and you, you're nourished by all of these. And you can produce in several of these. Okay? So that's one of the basis of the, of the, of the culture of effervescence. Uh, but the other basis of the culture of effervescence, for example, in Vienna, was a sort of a... Uh, was, uh, in order to understand this, you have to understand the society. The, the type of society that formed the core of the, of the, of the uh, uh, Austrian Empire. And so what were the groups, the social groups? So first of all, there was an aristocracy. Aristocracy, nobility, classical nobility, and no, noble titles inherited. They were the topmost in a way, right? Each of them had their own role. There was a high economic elite, bankers, financiers, kind of nouveau rich, uh, became rich, so it was the high bourgeoisie. But the bulk of it was a sort of a middle bourgeoisie, right, who were the carriers of, of sort of, and gave the nature to this empire uh, to a large degree, a middle bourgeoisie. There was lower bourgeoisie, then there was the proletariat, which wasn't that large, though. I mean, comparatively with, you know, England or whatever, right? Because, because these lands were not as highly industrialized as, as England was. You know. uh, so this was this bourgeoisie. And why is the bourgeoisie important for our discussion of culture? Because, for example, in Vienna, uh, you know, uh, this bourgeoisie was the major actor and producer and consumer of high culture. In Vienna of 1900, and there's, there are famous books about this, Fin de siècle uh, Vienna, Vienna 1900, uh, uh, Thunder at Twilight, uh, uh, and, and so on, right? And they're all about the culture of, of Vienna at 1900. This moment where, in Vienna, the, the, the common, the most important value, the, the thing people talked about on street, and you know, middle class people, was not about money, was not about the cars they have, not about whatever. The, the value that everybody tried to fit, and the subject of conversation was high culture. The things that they talked about was what is playing at the opera, and, as a fact. And what is the latest gossip about the opera? And what are the latest turnarounds there? Or the theater? Or writers? The writers, the, the, those who, who created art and culture, were the stars of this. And they were nourished and kept up by this large population for whom this was a value. And the way in which the bourgeoisie, and there are studies about this, and, and uh, with which I'm very familiar, and I wrote on this as well. Uh, the, this middle class, the bourgeoisie of, of Vienna, was uh, the, their very lifestyle was predicated upon the supremacy of the cultural values. The cultural values, and this had to do with the nature of the empire. The nature of the empire, which was still sort of a holdover from the feudal era, era moving into the modern era. It's such an interesting thing that you have this entity <coughs> that Transitions is, is at the, really, again, at the crossroads of so many things. Is the last holdout of feudalism moving into modernity gradually and being torn apart by modernity. 
uh, right? For example, it, so many phenomena happens here and it, it, it clashed out here. So, because it was a, a more classical, it, it, you know, uh, it was more of a holdout hold of, of, of the feudal era, of, of, uh, of the classical era, it also carried with it the values of the classical era. This was not a society uh, torn apart by, uh, you know, the market economy, by the, you know, laissez-faire, uh, you know, liberal economics. Liberal meaning classical liberalism. Whenever you read in the book liberal, it means not what in the United States today it's called liberal, which has nothing to do with that. I mean, has some, but it's different. The classical liberalism was the idea of individual freedom, uh, strong state, and uh, uh, free market. All of this was classical liberalism in the 19th century. And this was opposed by the conservatives, which were back to, you know, feudalism, a more hierarchical society, each with their own role, more stable, the market shouldn't be just let alone to run and destroy everything, but because we have values that surpass the market. And notice that when you read the, you know, reading the chapter on the politi politics of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you notice that you had governments who represented the liberal forces, and they failed when they had a big economic crisis, like we have lived through, but what worse. Um, and there were conservative forces, right? and then there were nationalistic forces, and then there were social democrats, who were a whole new trend, mostly appealing to the workers and so on. But anyway, the point is here uh, that the empire was sort of a holdout hold out from this classical era, from, the, from, a, from a different sort of, sort of society, not so much determined and, and shaped by the power of, of the market or, or impersonal powers of, of of the money, but where the true values were considered to be the cultural values. And that's what makes it special. This is why perhaps that now you might be able, might start to understand what in the world was Kundera talking about uh, when he talked uh, about um, uh, Central Europe being defined by culture. Central Europe being defined by culture. Stop the video right now and start again.